Today we're here with Barbara X, the founder and CEO of Whitespace, a sharing economy business that offers flexible, affordable, short-term meeting and training room space in China. So Barbara, it is awesome to have you on the show today. Um, I'm really excited to start by giving us a bit of your background and how you ended up in China. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I ended up in China. It all happened by accident, including founding this business, being in China, everything. It just followed circumstances, and here I am. So about 18 years ago, I was living in London, and my Australian fiancé came to me and said, I've been offered this two-year contract in China. What do I do? And I said, oh, we should move to China. We should definitely move to China. Um, and so I went into my boss. I was working for a, a small uh, niche consulting company at the time. I went into my boss and I said, you know how you were talking about a China strategy in 2006? Uh, well, an Asia strategy in 2006. How about 2005? Because I'm going to China. So I'm either resigning or I'm opening the Asia branch. Your choice. And he was like, oh, you're definitely opening the Asia branch. So uh, we got married, uh, and in January 2005, we moved to Dalian, China. I spoke no Chinese. I'd never lived in China before. It was the start of our, uh, I'm making air quotes, two-year contract. And uh, 17 years later, I'm still here. Now, how did people react around you when you said to them, I'm going to China? Did anyone try to dissuade you uh, and talk you out of uh, you know, the craziness? No. Um, well, oddly enough, my family seemed to have this attraction to China because my part of the reason it was so easy for me to say yes was that my older sister had actually uh, been going back and forth to China since the early 90s. Um, she was a professor at Beijing University. She'd gone to China on Fulbright scholarship. She'd been doing research. And so by the time I gone. It was quite normal in my family. Oh, Rachel goes to China. Okay. Barbara's going to China. That's, that's okay. Also, you know, my husband's Australian. I'm American. We had met in London. We were kind of used to a global lifestyle. So I think people just shrugged and went, okay, they're doing that now. And of course, t today, this is much more common. But I think back in 2005, uh, you were definitely, so, you know, one of the first, uh, especially a female founder, right? Uh, well, you know, probably the first group of, uh, Entrepreneurs who are a lot more global in how they thought. Uh, I, I remember when I came to the U.S., uh, my board uh, begged me not to go to China and, and begged me just to stay focused on the U.S. market. And it's like, hell no, the world is global and how can we neglect all these people? And like you, I said, we're going to China. And, you know, the way I went to China was, was crazy, too. I didn't move to China like you moved to China. That's a real commitment. But we certainly committed resources and we made a lot of mistakes. Um, and I think that was barriers to entry because, you know, by the time you're in China and you've made mistakes, then the market's ready. You're ready to go. Your competitors come in and, and make the same mistakes. Did you, did you, so how, how were the first few years? And um, you went up to set up the Asian office. Was the intention ever to start your own company or was it just to see where the world takes you? I think it was much more at that point to see where the world takes me. Um, I would not have called myself a founder at that time. I was working in a consulting company, starting a branch. Um, w in retrospect, I can look back at my career and there were all these steps along the way to becoming a founder. But uh, I, th I think it was just, let's have this adventure now and uh, see where the path goes. What, what advice do you have for people who are in a corporate setting right now? Uh, and, you know, it, it's an interesting time as we're emerging from a pandemic. Um, how, you know, you made, a, you made a pretty critical life decision there. And there was a lot of fear, I'm sure. Or, you know, if not for you, a lot of people are going to have fear about making big decisions. Any advice to people who are going through a lot of change right now, looking to switch careers and also thinking about starting a company? Well, thinking of starting a company is a big step, but you can't really minimize that. And um, having done it, I, you know, three years in, I say, if I'd known it was going to be this hard, I might not have done it. <laughs> but um, I always compare it to uh, having a child. 
right? When before you've done it, you can't possibly know what it's going to be like, but you just take that leap of faith and you go for it, and then and then you're in it and you're growing together, and you wouldn't trade that path for anything else. Advice for people thinking about taking the step, if you can. I mean, I just said okay, we're moving to China, but if you're thinking about leaving a job and you know starting your own company, the trick is always break it into small steps. You don't have to quit tomorrow and go full time. You can make it your side hustle. You can do things to test the market. It's all about those. Those. I mean, you know this better than anybody. It's minimum viable product. It's incremental steps. It's Test the market and do something small, and then see how you like it. Until you get to that point where it's you know quit full time and and commit yourself to it. That's right, and it's not you know, you're quitting full time to to work three full time jobs basically you know, and that's twenty four hours a day literally. It's funny when you talk about your baby too.、Um, it, it is literally. I remember people asking me, you know, oh, oh your father, how many kids do you have? And I'd be like, probably two hundred and fifty. You know, like every single employee and and、uh, the whole company feels like it's you, it's your identity. It's also very hard for founders because your your identity is tied to the success of your company, and it's very important to break that because you will have ups and downs. And and God, if you could just, you know, if I could go back to the previous me who blew his twenties working nonstop. Uh, on my company, it'd be like there'll be plenty of downs, so just chill out, relax. This is a long-term game.、Uh, but like you, I, I think I'd have the same advice. Don't just jump into it. I think at times I've said to people, jump into it, but on average,、uh, not knowing who the listener is <laughs> of this segment, right?、Um, be thoughtful. It's a big commitment, and and just get moving. But moving doesn't mean like big dramatic action. It means have a conversation, talk to somebody this week. And get you know, get out there and think about what an MVP looks like. Absolutely,、um, and we'll, we'll I'm sure talk about my business later. But I was lucky enough to have an,、uh, the opportunity to kind of prototype the idea、uh, for about a year before I、uh, put my money on the lease and said, "Okay, we're doing this." Yeah, so let's maybe talk about that. The steps you took. Um, of course, someone listening to you, first impression they might get is, "What? Let's go to China without speaking the language? Wow, she's impulsive. She makes you know quick decisions and doesn't think through them." But you did think through things, and you, you've been quite methodical. So maybe walk us through the steps and how, how you actually got to where you are. Well, in terms of、uh, founding White Space,、uh, I、uh, had the idea from 2012, which was basically bringing co-working to China.、Um, so I. Uh, had read a、uh, an in-flight magazine article about co-working、uh, when it was so early, 2012. It didn't even have that name yet. They didn't call it co-working. It was just these new office, hip office spaces with in empty warehouses with Wi-Fi and coffee that you could join. And I read the article, and I was flying from, you know, Beijing to London because I was still working with the consulting company at the time. And I read the article, and I thought I could use this.、Um, this would work in China. And I tore out the article and I started showing it to people and saying, "We should start this. This would definitely work in Shanghai. Let's do this."、Uh, and everyone told me it was a terrible idea and it would never work.、Um, so from 2012 until I formally started Whitespace in 2018, I was playing with the idea. I was going, doing what you said, going out and talking to people and. Trying to get、uh, co-founders involved and testing this and talking about this and doing a, so it was not impulsive. It was a six-year sort of ramp up to finally pulling out my own seed money and putting it down and saying we're starting this company. What happened in the meantime in 2012? I did not start co-working in China, but I kept、uh, monitoring the market and. Um, working at still working as a as an independent consultant at the time, I found that by the time co working came, I'd already been working remote for a decade. I didn't need a co working space anymore because my home office game was tight, right? But I did need meeting rooms. I did need a space to meet with my clients, and. None of the solutions, including co-working, were working for me.、Um, I could meet them in a hotel, which was incredibly overpriced.、Um, I tried meeting with them in serviced offices where I could rent a meeting room、uh, by the hour, 
and the service was bad. It was not catered for me. They were clearly oriented towards serving their tenants. And then they had these meeting rooms that were extra that they kind of put on the market, but they weren't really uh, optimizing the service towards someone who wasn't a tenant. And so the booking process was incredibly painful. Um, I booked the meeting room for two hours. I showed up early. They wouldn't let me into the room in spite of the fact that it was an entire floor of glass walled meeting rooms. I could see they were all empty. They're not going to sell it between 9 and 10 a.m. But their rules were you can't go into the room until you've booked it. So I'm sitting in the lobby waiting. Right. And then we went in. My client shows up. He's got extra people in tow. And so we need more chairs. And they charge me extra for the chair. And I felt so ripped off by the process. That was my moment of like, there's got to be a better way. Yes. Frustration. That, that's often the purest reason to start a company too, when you realize, I don't have a choice. I'm so frustrated with the way things are being done now. I have to go and fix this problem. And I think that's usually one of the purest motivations to start a company. That's when you genuinely don't care what people are saying at this point. Like, I'm frustrated. I, I suffered this. I cannot believe someone else should suffer this. A company needs to be built, and I guess I have to do it. Exactly. It was like, this This cannot be this bad. There has to be a better way to do it. Did, did, did it feel to you you were too early back then? I mean, you're talking, you know, uh, in the 2010s, right? Uh, did, did, did it feel to you like, this is a bit of a trend, but this trend is really nascent and it only really applies to people like you who are jet setting executives flying around the world? Or did you feel like, no, this is going to be mass one day? I mean, COVID obviously changed all of this, but back then, where did you feel the market was? Uh, certainly when I started the conversation is with people 2012, 2013, it felt very, very early. Um, but uh, I was kind of used to being out in front of the pack. I mean, I come from a, a tech background, actually. So I was involved in the, the dot-com bu bubble. Do you remember that? E-business in the 2000s. Um, and uh, when that came along, I'd already been using the internet, what was even the ARPANET, um, since the mid-80s. So I was like, you guys have taken a while to catch on to the fact that interconnectivity is really the future. Um, so I was kind of used to the experience of when I tell people about a trend that's coming and they don't see it, they're just going to probably get it in about a decade. Um, God, that sounds really arrogant. I, I, <laughs> I don't actually have that much self-belief. But I do know when a trend is coming, I can see that this is going to be big. Let's be frank, right? Uh, I, I, when I came up uh, with, with, with my startup, uh, it was when apps were sort of growing and people were like, why are you pitching this mobile app thing? You know, like build a web platform. I'm like, no, you're an idiot. Like to me, it's so obvious that people are going to be using their apps and you have to sort of dumb down your, your, uh, your confidence and you have to realize that where people are coming from, it's not, it's not like they see what you see to you. Like, you know, your first name, you're, you're as confident that this is where the market's going. I just feel this in my bones, but you're going to come across extremely arrogant. Of course, if, if you, if you, if you say that to someone else. And I realized at times I had to be like, well, you know, there's this app revolution. Here's sort of the compound annual growth rate. Here's Gartner and Forrester, you know, trying to estimate the market size. We see a gradual shift in my mind. I'm thinking you're an idiot. Like, like this is going to completely transform every aspect of technology. And so I, I, I can appreciate how you could come across arrogant if you have so much belief in the trend, but others don't, you know, and, and that's, I think that's vision or, or craziness. Either way, both are similar things. Right. It's, it's hard to know which one it is until you look backwards and see whether it worked out or not. Right. I, I, I still could be wrong. I laugh. It's like, well, I don't know. The story's not over yet. But I see this trend. It's a wave coming.